I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. This TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. For a long time, the world has been suffering depressing news about world affairs, economics, human rights, the environment, the climate, and other issues. As a result, a lot of people who care about these issues can be feeling depressed and demoralized. But over the years, people who persist in grassroots movements for civil rights, peace, labor, the environment, and so forth, keep saying that what keeps these movements moving ahead is when people share their stories. And so this month's TV program will feature personal experiences and stories and insights from six local people who have worked effectively for peace and social justice. We'll enjoy hearing three of these guests during the first half hour and three other guests during the second half hour. For the first 30 minutes, I'm happy to welcome Marilyn Duncan, Bob Ziegler, and Debbie Eden. And then the program's second half will feature James Bowers, Holly Gwynn Graham, and Douglas Mackey. And so this will be an, an interesting program, and I'm happy to welcome Marilyn and Bob and Debbie. Debbie, let's start with you. Our uh, community has enjoyed Heart Sparkle Players for a long time, and on Friday, one Friday each month, um, at Traditions Cafe, Heart Sparkle Players will choose a theme and then invite people who are present in the audience to share some stories, and then you creatively reenact them. And it's just a marvelous thing to, to uh, experience. Um, through your playback theater. And so when I was choosing the topic for tonight and coming up with the name Stories of Working for Peace and Justice, I thought, this sounds just like a Heart Sparkle Players mm -hmm. thing where you have stories of dot, 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 different one each month. I wonder, can you just share, us, share with us something of, of your sense of the power of stories and then how Heart Sparkle Players uses stories to bring things alive? Mm -hmm. Well... In playback theater, what happens, as you said, is that a member of the audience tells a story and the actors and the musician play it back. And so essentially what happens in a playback theater performance is that everyone in the room has a, a dialogue using stories, which is something we humans do all the time. Only we have this medium of theater that creates a piece of art out of their stories. And one of the things that we've chosen to do in our public performance is that we always collaborate with a community group or we highlight a guest artist, but most of the time it's a community group. So an example, was this season we collaborated with a group called um, Peace Scouts, which is a local organization that works with children around peace. And so what happens is people in the audience would tell stories of peace. And um, I think the power of stories is that it's an elemental part of who we are as humans. It's in our bones to tell each other our stories. And our thought with the Heart Sparkle Players and collaborating with groups in the community that are doing good work, that are you know, working for peace, for justice, um, is that we 
bring hope, that we remind people that, yes, indeed, all those things that you spoke of in your introduction are indeed happening. However, humans need hope. And so we're also always doing very positive things to bring hope to one another. And so that's part of, um, that's part of our mission. That's part of what we do. And that's part of what happens when people tell stories from you know, their own lives. They bring that hope alive. Do you have a story from your own experience that you could share right now? And then we'll have a chance a bit later to, to do some more sharing. Well, one thing that came to my mind just now, as you just said that, was one of the groups that we work with um, are a group of young adults who have developmental disabilities. They're called the Thunders. And we do workshops with them, and then they perform with us in our public performances. And I remember a particular story um, from a young woman who has a developmental disability talking about someone who had belittled her because of her disability. And the power of her being able to tell that story and to have it acted out where she actually, because actually in the story, she didn't get a chance to say what she wanted to say, to do what she wanted to do. But she said she wanted that in her story. That's how she wanted it to end. And so it ended with her being able to say, you know, I don't want to be treated that way. I want you to accept me for who I am. So there was that empowerment was sort of like mm -hmm. all these different levels of things that were happening. Mm -hmm. So that's a story that comes to my mind. That's great, yeah. I, I, I know when I've seen it, it your uh, uh, playback theater uh, through Heart Sparkle is, is an amazing thing. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad that we have here, you here to share with us. Thank you. Bob, when I came up with the, the, the topic of sharing stories, I thought, i got to get Bob as a guest because uh, everybody around town who knows Bob knows he has these wonderful stories uh, uh, that, that in some cases they illustrate the points that we'll be doing on the show, and some are just fun stories from things that you've experienced. Um, I wonder, you, you've done a lot of work over the years with uh, El Salvador and people from El, El Salvador, and you've gone there several times. And I wonder, could you share this story about the, uh, the zone of peace that some people created there? Right, uh, back in 1998, uh, there was, um, uh, Jose Chancho Alice told us about a group of people he was working with in rural uh, El Salvador. And they were trying to organize 86 villages into a zone of peace. They're going to restructure their society from the bottom up and uh, confront. El Salvador has gone through a very brutal civil war for 12 years. And uh, there was 25% of the country had fled for their lives in this brutal civil war. The death squads and the U.S. government helped the military kill a lot of people in El Salvador. And there's a lot of uh, destruction, environmental and human. Uh, there was, uh, but anyway, these folks are trying to heal from that. And um, uh, they were going to declare their area, they're going to have a march and declare their area a local zone of peace. And I thought that's a really noble idea, but there's no way they're going to pull that off. Everything's working against them. It's our government, their government, the International Monetary Fund. Everything is set up for them to lose. I thought there's no way they're going to pull off, but let's, let's go support them, stand with them. And uh, I was a little bit naive. I didn't realize the power of the Campesino women there that were well organized. Uh, they, um, they knew what was right and what was wrong and weren't going to settle for what was wrong anymore. And they had this persistent resistance. Uh, they would also focus on what worked and uh, not what wasn't working. And they were able to build on the positive gains they had made. And they've actually, within uh, five years when I went back, the level of violence dropped from very, very severe to practically nothing because the conflict resolution training that they had done in their communities, they're working on environmental restoration projects and pulling them off. And others uh, are working on literacy, organic gardening and farming. And they actually were uh, the creating an alternative society. Uh, and I thought it was totally impossible, but it was just persistent resistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't, isn't uh, persistent resistance sort of the, the Spanish uh, translation for what people talk about when they have, uh, when they refer to organized nonviolent change? It's, I don't recall the exact Spanish term, but it's, 
it's something that translate pretty clearly to that. Exactly that, yes. So yeah, and, and it's a great, great concept. Um, uh, Debbie had mentioned hope, and you mentioned when we were preparing for the program something that a Salvadoran refugee had mentioned to you about hope. Can you share that? Right. She was 15 years old, and she said, Bob, she said, don't ever give up hope, and never let them take hope away from you, because once they've taken away your hope, they've taken away everything. Mm -hmm. So it's an act of resistance. Having hope was an act of resistance. Yeah. And you mentioned to me some, something that a college professor, college uh, instructor of some sort had, had said about hope as well. Right, it was a teaching assistant and he was doing his research on revolutions and social change. And uh, so he was um, a teaching class, he wrote on the blackboard, hope equals revolution. Uh -huh. And he said that people think that uh, revolutions happen when things are hopeless. That's not the case. Every revolution, every social change from the French Revolution to the Civil Rights Movement has happened because people had a vision of hope of a better world. Yeah, great. Well, let Marilyn, let's, thanks, thanks, Bob. Uh, Marilyn, let, let's um, see what we can glean from your experience. You're <laughs> relatively new to Olympia, but you have a great background of having worked for uh, good things uh, elsewhere. Uh, can you share uh, a story or experience? Sure. Um well, I, I like what we're talking about hope right now. It's, it's, so, it's so important. And in your introduction, you talked about um, all the issues that we're facing today as a people, from economic problems to education to our budgets within the, within the states. And um, I think all of us have want to be involved. We want to do something. And, um, but I don't know that we all know how. When I moved up here, I, I, um, I've only been up in the Olympia area going on two years, but um, I didn't really know how to get involved up here. And my core um, focus is on justice, issues of justice. And uh, that has brought me into many communities, because I've moved a lot, um, of wanting to get involved with organizations that are working on justice. There's so much that we can work on right now, and there's oceans of information out there. I don't know that, um, I know that my capacity is limited on what I can absorb, but I know that um, if I can focus in on one or two areas that are really important to me, um, I found with justice that the Martin Luther King uh, event was, was very dear to my heart because Dr. King, of course, worked for Justice for All. And the county that I moved up from is a very rural, um, a very, very rural area, um, very red state kind of, not really, you know, big on diversity or, or, or different things like that. So um, when we decided that we were going to do an event for Martin Luther King, it was preaching to the handful of people that lived in that county that we called the choir. They were the ones that, you know, agreed with us. We couldn't get anyone else active. We couldn't bring in um, more than maybe 50 people were coming. And this went on year after year. It was the same people that came. And then someone had a brilliant idea. Well, let's, let's start with uh, the, the kids in the school. Let's start an essay contest. And um, the people in our group that were, were interested in education, were interested in writing, they're the ones that got involved in that. We, you know, when you bring children into a uh, activity, their parents come. So we increased participation through the parents. And then we, we looked around and we thought, wow, this, this community is churches, um, mostly, mostly churches. There was a I think one synagogue that was in the county over and uh, a Baha'i um, community. So we, we went off to each of the leaders of the different churches and invited them and made them part of the event. And um, last time I heard that that event was drawing in 12, 1,200 people. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, what a chance to educate. And uh, I came up here and I'd like to get involved in that event, and I know that the Fellowship of Reconciliation 
has been, is certainly with what I believe in. And one thing about peace workers, there's always work. Mm -hmm. So um, again, I just think when we focus in on the, the thing that interested us the most that we can touch upon, mm -hmm. keeps us going. Great, Thank, thanks for sharing that. Debbie, when we were talking a few minutes ago uh, with you, it was mostly in the context of heart sparkle players. I wonder, can you share uh, some other experience or story, um, either uh, also from Heart Sparkle or anything else in your background or experience? Well, one thing that I was thinking about in, um, is that, you know, the Heart Sparkle players were a theater company with musicians as well. And we hear, I've heard, you know, in, our, in my 20 years that I've been doing playback theater, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories from children to adults, people who are incarcerated, you know, at conferences, I mean, just all kinds of places. And I was thinking about the impact of the stories on us, you know, the players. Hearing these various places that we go to, and how that instills hope and um, compassion and empathy. And I was thinking about a story. We went, we performed for a conference for the Department of Corrections, and it was a diversity conference, and it was celebrating di diversity within the, you know, the people who worked in corrections. And a young man you know, in his maybe late 20s, early 30s came up and, and told a story. And he told one of those stories that are epic stories. He said that his life had began in a garbage can, that he had been left to die by his mother when he was born. And someone found him and heard him. And I thought, wow. I am sitting next to someone whose life could have not been, but he was found as a baby. And then he began to tell his story about being in foster care and all these things that had happened to him and how at a pivotal point in his life, he decided he was going to make changes in his own life, that his life was not going to be about being found in a garbage can. And that was amazing to me. And that story has stayed with me over these years, you know, of the bravery of this man and the courage that it took for him to move from that beginning to where he was now. And I guess that's what I would like to say is that those individual stories have given me and the, our group so much hope as well as the people who are in the room who hear those stories. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Bob, you've got an interesting story from a family in Kansas who had hosted a, a woman from Kenya in, uh, when she was going to college back in the 60s. Tell, tell us that story. It was about 1960s, a woman from Kenya. I was a college student at, uh, at St. Scholastica College in, in Atchison, Kansas. And she'd spend um, vacations with a, with, with a family outside of Wichita in a small community. And uh, there was, um, the, the family was criticized by some members of their community. Some people wouldn't shop at their hardware store mm -hmm. as a result that they had a black person mm -hmm. um, uh, in their home and introduce them in the community. Uh, there was, uh, in 2004, the student went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize. She was Wangari Mathai. And uh, there was, um, so these people were just doing something, you know, being a little bit compassionate, but doing nothing out of the ordinary. And er, when Wangari Mathai comes back to the United States, she always visits her North American mother and father. And uh, so uh, there was, my friend's parents end up on the front page of the paper <laughs> each time. So it's a uh -huh. whole different shifting uh -huh. of things uh, where they were, uh, 45 years ago, yeah. 45, 50 years ago. You've got a story also that, that uh, I like. It, uh, a Native American woman uh, at a ceremony was using flint to light a fire. Can you tell us that one? 
right? It was a weekend event, a weekend ceremony, and she was going to light, uh, light the fire. She's got this flint. She's trying to get it to spark. And the others, they've got these cedar logs and uh, alder and cedar logs that they're trying to light. They're going to provide the heat and the light for the event. And she's going along. She's telling stories as she's doing this. And she's welcoming us to the event and goes on with some stories and telling us. And I'm sitting there thinking, will someone please hand her a lighter? Yeah. You know, <laughs> and uh, there was, um, so anyway, she grabs a little piece of dry grass in her hand. And with a flint, she strikes it. And it catches fire. The whole thing starts up and, mm -hmm. and, the, and the fires go. And she says, this is just to show when conditions are right, all it takes is a spark. <laughs> that was great. Thanks. It was that teaching, yeah. teaching moment. Uh, this great. whole, this whole, uh, yeah. whole story. Yeah, yeah. Catch you by surprise at the end. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Marilyn, do you have uh, uh, something else to, to share with us? Um, you're interested in, in talking about uh, uh, trying to get time with the congressional representative and. Yeah, and it, it, it kind of ties in with hope because I know that with all of us, um, all the work that we do, sometimes we, you know, you work so hard and, and you don't see anything change and I, it's hard to keep that um, hope that, that yet I think together we, we just like doing this, mm -hmm. it brings that together. Um, well, my story is, is um, took place where I came from and not in this area at all. I'm not mm -hmm. talking about any of our local representatives. I hope not any likened to this story. Um, we had um, tried to get a, a meeting with our local congressional representative and um, through a series of phone calls and, and it started and uh, which were ignored. No one called us back. We um, this went on for several weeks. We went down to their office, their, the local office of the congressional person. Of course, they weren't there, but they finally offered a staff person to meet with us. And we said, no, we really want to meet with our representative. We want to talk about some issues that are affecting our lives and um, their constituents. Uh, still nothing. We could, we could not get through. Well. I was going to a um, meeting in Washington, D.C., so I called ahead, almost a month ahead, to get an appointment to see the congressman. Um, they set up a time. I got there, and I had a staff person. I still didn't, mm -hmm. didn't have him. And, uh, and in fact, when I went, a representative from um, uh, Action West, Peace Action West, mm. went with me. And we, um, we persisted, but I, I'm sad to say we never did get an appointment. But then again, they weren't reelected either. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we've shared some stories. We have a couple minutes before we take our break. And I wonder, is there anything we want to share collectively, either if you find common threads or something that deserves some follow-up or commentary? Stories are real, real important in the Native American cultures, the way in which cultures passed on. And I think in Hard Sparkle, you also do that um, a bit. You know, our culture is presented and other things are, are, are put forth that are complex situations where it may be difficult to deal with, but in story form, it provides a way in which people can, can um, uh, there was, um, uh, internalize and actualize and um, and uh, be able to move beyond an event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was also thinking of you know the opportunity to tell your story and um, you know you were talking about the Martin Luther King and getting the children involved by writing essays and by you know and I was thinking of how you know a, a way to get people involved in things is to make the story bigger to include more you know in the story also so there's this there's this aspect of the singular story relating to everyone and what we can learn and then there's also this aspect of like when 
when we can make the story larger and include people so that their story is included in the larger story, how, how wonderful that is because mm -hmm. that's a part of what we need as humans is belonging, right. you know, mm -hmm. is being a part of. The community. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I appreciate that element in Heart Sparkle's format. You find ways to, to broaden this out and bring everybody into uh, a sharing of a, mm -hmm. of a larger story. It's, mm -hmm. it's, I think that's one of the one of the many satisfying aspects of, of, of uh, attending a, a performance that Heart Sparkle players uh, would do. There was, uh, Pete Seeger has a CD out in which he's, um, uh, he does it, he's 90 years old and he does it with children. And I think being able to expand children can be a real power. Uh, there was, in this, he empowers the kids and he, they realize they have a voice. Mm -hmm. And that someone will listen to their voice. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. I, I want to thank all three of you for your sharing of voices and stories and hope and wisdom. Um, we'll, uh, so I want to thank Marilyn Duncan and Bob Ziegler and Debbie Eden. Um, in just a few minutes, we have three other guests who will fill these seats and share their stories and their insights. Uh, that transition time of just a few minutes, we will watch... Uh, a video, a short video of some kids in Afghanistan who have a story of their own journey to Kabul from Bamiyan province to Kabul for, uh, to hold a, a peace rally, which was uh, a rare thing there. And uh, it's a powerful story. And then after we come back, one of our guests in the second half, uh, Douglas Mackey, will tell us some more about that and that effort. And um, <coughs> Joining Douglas will be Holly Gwynn Graham and James Bowers, who have their own great stories to share with us. So I want to thank Marilyn and Bob and Debbie and invite the people who are watching to uh, stay with us, watch this short video, and then meet uh, three more interesting folks uh, in the second half of the show. Thanks. Thank you.
تشکر زنده باشه ما Welcome to the second half of this program of Stories of Working for Peace and Justice. We have three different guests uh, with us now. We have uh, Douglas Mackey over there, Holly Gwynn Graham, and James Bowers, closest to me. They'll be sharing stories with us. And we'll start with Douglas, who can give us some more information about what we just saw, the short video about these young Afghani uh, kids who uh, are, have been working for peace. So tell us some more about the video we just watched. The blue scarves, this color, that you may recall from uh, the video, uh, were chosen to uh, be worn by the 30-plus participants in a uh, peace walk held in Kabul to commemorate um, their wish to live without wars that they were <clears throat> holding in combination with visitors from around the world and a um, international Skype call to ask um, everyone in Kabul and on, around the world to um, hear their request to live without wars. Uh, it's, it may be the first time that a nonviolent um, rally of its kind uh, has been held in Kabul. Uh, other rallies have been uh, cons packed with considerably more emotion than, than what you saw there. It's just, it's just each one of these uh, videos, that's one of 135 videos that the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers have put together, are a story in and of themselves. And so they're using um, stories as a powerful way to share their experience and the experience of the ordinary people of Afghanistan, stories that otherwise would not be heard um, above the the din of war, warlords, Taliban, etc. Um, this particular story um, is, is an important one because it included more women than has been the case in the previous videos. Uh, it would not be appropriate for women to be primary actors, if you will, in the videos uh, culturally, and so they're very careful uh, about that. Uh, but things are changing, and as of, uh, this was uh, March um, 17th, 18th, and 19th, in that time period. Of, when of the, 2011. This, this, yeah. this past March, right. uh, when that uh, walk was held, um, it, there were women coming to the fore. Uh, the group that they gathered with is called Open Society and is led in large measure by women in Kabul. Uh, the um, um, other interesting piece, uh, sort of turning of things or a hint of it that you see in the video, um, take a look at it again if you, have, mm -hmm. uh, if you have a chance to do that. You'll notice in the beginning of the video, the police are standing there with their shields. Mm -hmm. They'd been warned about this demonstration coming, but by the end of the video and you see that the walk has progressed. They walked uh, over to the United Nations uh, office in Kabul. The police who were there, you know, to kind of keep things calm had transitioned to walking along with them and in subsequent conversations we've learned that um, the police were kind of saying, you know, we believe in the same thing you do. Mm -hmm. Yes, we agree with you. <laughs> and, uh, so each one of these videos really has another story that, that goes along along with it. Yeah. Um, yeah, those are great great videos. Thanks, thanks. For, I appreciate your <clears throat> your um, persistence in helping them get their stories out to the rest of the world and to get people connected. And we, maybe we can talk some more about that in a, yeah. in a few minutes. Holly, um, lots of people in this town know you and respect you and appreciate. Um, things that you've done, and a lot of people don't know about the work that you did in Skagit County, more than 100 miles north of Olympia, uh, decades ago. 
So tell us some of that. I was extremely lucky to discover La Conner, Washington, after a train ride in 77 from Florida, where I had been introduced to anti-nuclear activism there in many marches trying to shut down several plants in Florida and stop uh, nuclear triggers being made by GE. When I came up here, I thought, I was reading even Cowgirls Get the Blues, and, and, I, and I had a dream that I was going home somehow, and I woke up crying, and I hitchhiked into La Conner and ended up meeting an extraordinary number of amazing people in Skagit County who were, at the time, in 77, involved in fighting a nuclear power plant which was proposed and being pushed very hard with lots of money by Puget Power right. at the time. And these people had formed a group called Skagit Citizens Against Nuclear Plants, or SCAMP. And they had put together, when I arrived, I think two years previous, <coughs> of music festivals in the summer. And every summer, there would be a music festival, and I think there were nine, maybe ten, that raised money to pay a lawyer for that year to fight Puget Power. Well, they had fought for a long time. I'm sure maybe it wasn't 10 years of festivals, but it was quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And people like Tom Robbins would come and lend their fame. And Tom Chapin, Harry Chapin's mm -hmm. brother, came. And we'd have national acts as well as locals like me mm -hmm. and you know bands that were involved. Linda Waterfall mm -hmm. came. Beautiful people mm -hmm. from all over the movement. And finally, we got this thing on the referendum because this plant was going to be built on the wild and scenic Skagit River, 10 miles from heartland of, of little towns like Mount Vernon and Burlington and Cedro Woolley on an earthquake fault overlooking farmland, just a terrible sight. And so the people got it on the referendum on the day that the vote was held, we won. Mm -hmm. And there was an earthquake on the site. <laughs> Do you love it? It couldn't have been more perfect. It was like Mother Nature saying, see, the people united won't get shook up. <laughs> so that was marvelous. SCAMP was a great yeah. organization. I, and I remember SCAMP. Uh, uh, so that, yeah, that's, that's great stuff. We'll come back and check back with you in a, a few minutes. Um, James, you're relatively new to Olympia, but uh, we've had I've, I've been able to hear a lot of your stories because you've been participating no, in you our... you haven't heard a lot yet. Uh, no, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, you've <clears throat> participated in our Wednesday vigils and Friday vigils, yeah. and I, I like to stand next to you and, and absorb these wonderful stories you have, and I thought, we got to get you out here to, to share some stories. Well, uh, I was just reminded of the anti-nuclear movement. That's kind of where I got my feet wet uh -huh. and, uh, in the beginning of my activism, uh -huh. you know, and so... Uh, I was thinking back, I was living in Oklahoma. If, that's not a contradiction in terms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I was living in Oklahoma City, and they were, there was a proposed nuclear electric plant to be built just outside Tulsa, which is 90 miles from Oklahoma City, but that's too close. Okay, so uh, people around the state in, in little groups of 12 to 15, sometimes 20, formed affinity groups you know, in their little communities. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and so uh, we began working to stop this plant. And there were essentially, and this was rather organic, it wasn't anything planned, although I found out that other groups have kind of done the same thing. There was an organization called CASE, Citizens Action for Safe Energy. And these were mostly the, the disgruntled farm owners whose land had been seized, you know, for a private, a profit, for profit corporation's mm -hmm. purposes. And they were using, you know, injunctions and petitions and, and uh, trying to uh, get their story into the media. And then there was the Sunbelt Alliance, which was where I first came in. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, mostly demonstrations, occupations, uh, nonviolent civil disobedience kinds of things. And then there was this third group called Mother Earth's Secret Service. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you've, if you're up on your Edward Abbey, there were monkey wrenchers. And I, I like to use this as an illustration of how a very few people, I mean, their mess was never more than seven people that I know of, uh, 
how a very few people can have more of an impact than you would ever think. If you know anything about how chain link fencing is, is put together, it's actually, uh, the, fen the fencing is, is just pretty much tied together. Uh -huh. But it's attached to the poles with just little bits of wire, about three for a, for a six foot fence. That's an exact number. Um, a pair of bolt cutters will take all three of those little wires loose. Now one night, in the middle of the night, somewhere near midnight, about a hundred feet of that chain link fence that surrounded the construction site sort of took a nap, sort of laid down on the ground. Now adjacent to that was a very muddy area that apparently they'd been trying to build a moat or something and it hadn't done very well. It had gotten everything very muddy, but the water didn't stay above the ground. It went into the ground. Well, three people walked across that muddy area from outside the construction site to the inside of the construction site, oh, maybe a hundred times a piece, so that it looked like a huge mob had just come into the, <laughs> into, into the plant. <laughs> And there were guys on, on ATVs with searchlights, and, and they were going crazy. You know, they're everywhere, going through the forest and everything. You know, some other things that, that mess did was uh, they walked completely around the, the whole site and, and mapped where the creeks came in and where the creeks went out and where there were wooded areas and, and things like that. But this was the crowning touch. One member was, a, was one the, an ultralight flyer. He flew over the site, took pictures of the construction, and then copies were sent to, to the board of directors of the company that was building the plant. And all they did was say, we're, we've just check, we're just checking, do you have permits for all this construction? Along with that was said, this is not a publicity stunt. This is just between you and us. <laughs> and um, about a year and a half later, they announced that they weren't going to build the plant after all. And so if you've never heard of the, of the Black Fox nuclear power station in northeastern Oklahoma, <laughs> there's a reason it doesn't exist. <laughs> So thanks, thanks, James. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Douglas, um, uh, let's see. Do you have a, uh, another story you can tell us? And, and we want to, we're sure. a bit tight, but we want to yeah. see if we can get something each from the, the three of you again. Um, Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers are really all about stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you were talking about the first half of the show, I think, it connects to what's happening with their stories is they'll be told to someone else. Someone else will say, gee, did you hear about uh, the high school here in town? 60 students were listening and told their friends. And so um, this um, group has grown now to uh, about you know, five or 600 people that are waiting for the every three months for another global day of listening. There have been 30 people from the United States, one from Germany, three from Australia, who have made the trip over to Afghanistan to visit with the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers so that they can collect their own story and then share it. And many of these stories are, have been seen recently in, uh, uh, from David Swanson and uh, Kathy Kelly, um, Simon uh, Moley from uh, Australia. Um, one in particular that came out of the Youth Peace Volunteers conference call um, was maybe f four people talking over a period of five or six minutes. A young man from Palestine shared with the youth in Afghanistan that he'd just lost a friend who'd been killed the day before. And they consoled him from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. In that consolation, their sorrow was uh, brought back to them about that they're feeling sad. Um, a woman from the Democratic Republic of Congo who had been introduced to 
the Youth Peace Volunteers by a friend of hers in September Families for Peaceful Tomorrow, September 11 Families. Right. And then this woman from the Congo introduced her friend from Rwanda, a young boy soldier who had, uh, you know, many several, you know, many years ago survived that. And he said to them, about four or five sentences, "I understand that what you're experiencing is um, is horrible. There are nights that you'll you go to bed and you don't know if you're going to wake up. You don't know if you want to wake up." But you do wake up again, and you realize that you have wishes, you have dreams. Keep those dreams, and I will dream with you. Mm. Mm. So the, this role that sharing each other's stories has for the people who are currently living in oppression or in occupied countries is, is incredibly important mm. for their ability to keep going another day. Great. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. I'm glad we mm. had a chance to make all of those connections geographically. Uh, uh, Holly, you're going to tell us something about the N reactor at Hanford in eastern Washington, um, and using the arts. And if we can do it kind of briefly, that'll help. Absolutely. In 1988, I do believe the N reactor was shut down. It was in Hanford, which is in southeastern Washington, the most polluted place on earth outside of Rocky Flats nuclear weapons manufacturing mm -hmm. plant filled with radiation, filled with radioactive waste from many years, including the development of the nuclear bomb in the Manhattan Project. <clears throat> People worked for many years to shut it down. I got to go there as an artist in the schools in 1986 because I had a 14-year career as an artist with the uh, Washington State Arts Commission, and I was there working in the Tri-Cities when Chernobyl happened. <coughs> I had been working previously to that with many people to shut the end reactor down and to make safe energy a reality. While I was working there, I worked with a woman uh, in Yakima, a songwriter named Tracy Spring, and a young videographer named David Graff, and we filmed the... Physicians for Social Responsibilities, Hanford and Human Health Symposium, which brought in big scientific intelligentsia like Dr. Carl Grossman, with whom I work in the Global Network, mm -hmm. and Robert Lawless, who was another doctor and ex doctor in extremely high physics. Many people who testified to the very serious conditions at Hanford, which were endangering the entire area, of course. And that video went on to play in the Inland Empire on public supported television for a couple of years and really woke the people up to what physicians for social responsibility were talking about, which is one nuclear bomb can just ruin your whole day and your health. And we've got the nuclear issue rising again. We have nuclear power being proposed as a green, safe, sustainable energy poppycock. And I know Helen Caldicott. She's been the energizer bunny of anti-nuclear activism. Right. She can rub people the wrong way, but she's a wonderful. And, you know, for her to say stuff like, you're lying to the people who are lying, <laughs> is worth its weight in gold. So we helped shut down the end reactor. I was just a small part of it. But... <laughs> It was important because people like Deborah Beetle, who broke her back picking apples, she stood out there on the road for days, for a year, with her crutches and held up her signs that said, shut it down, shut it down. Uh -huh. People marched every day. The people shut it down. And we've got to pray that Fukushima doesn't have the same repercussions that the whole industry needs to be right. shut down. Yeah. Right. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, James, you, you know a guy in... Uh, Redlands, California, mm -hmm. that started Peace Group. Can you tell sure. us that story okay. pretty, pretty briefly? <clears throat> All right. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, his name's Brian, and he, uh, I was at the Friends meeting. He stood up one Sunday to speak mm -hmm. and, and said how, you know, uh, President Bush's policies, you know, toward Afghanistan and Iraq, he just, just he was so upset and he couldn't sit still any longer mm -hmm. and that he was going to start standing on, a, on, a, on the busiest street corner in Redlands, California, uh, and holding a sign protesting the war. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, this is a very conservative, very Republican town. And I was kind of concerned, so I called a couple of people and I said, 
Brian's going to stand out there all by himself. He's going to get killed. So, uh, and so I went down to make sure he was okay. So did 13 other people. And after that, then there were 25, then there were 40, then there was 125, then there were over oh. 300, you know. And, and then the invasion took place and mm -hmm. it dwindled off. There's still to this day an organization that started from that vigil that Citizens Action for Peace, and they do an incredible number of, of activities. There's over 100 members, so they're very, very active. Mm -hmm. They give peace awards every year. It's a huge banquet. All activists from Los Angeles to Palm Springs show up, oh. and uh, it's it's a real good time to you know to get together and swap stories. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great. Thanks. Yeah. Well, we we've swapped some stories here. And then you folks heard the stories that the first three guests had. And I'm wondering, are you seeing any either common threads or insights or anything that needs to be commented upon? Uh, wow. Bob, earlier we heard um, about so maybe we ought to do this you know, privately too. So you know. Oh, yeah. James said that uh, dur during James, our break James, when yeah. we. Uh, yeah. 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 So, um, and, and Bob alluded to uh, the, the value, the long-term value that it has. And I'm wondering how we might encourage the viewers hmm. to, uh, to share their stories. Maybe hmm. they could just call you up some and let you know that they have stories. Well, or or maybe, invite some of their friends over. over. Yeah. 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 Or invite some we, people that they don't know over. <laughs> or come to one of the FOR gatherings, right, perhaps, right, that you'll be right, advertising right, to right. tell your stories and sit around. Yeah. I think the theme, too, is that the human condition is love. And I really believe we're one human family. We share one African mother, mitochondrial Eve. May she <laughs> live in our hearts forever. That's a hell and of a first name. Isn't know? it yeah. mitochondrial? <laughs> <Yeah. though? laughs> and our first Cro-Magnon <laughs> mom. Okay. We really have to get over all the rest of it. Yeah. Okay. We yeah. have to just get over it, you know? I loved your yeah. stories. Thank yeah. you yeah. both. The story about the woman who was, was trying to start a fire yeah. with Flint. Yeah, yeah that was as, brilliant. As soon as I thought, as soon as that story was related, I thought, that reminds me of Brian, you know. Uh -huh. There's a, one little spark, yeah. you know, yeah. one little right. one guy stood up, and yeah. that's it. And yeah, yeah, it's so cool. The, there's some of these recurring themes, and this is what makes a classic is something that just stays perennially relevant, and people can identify with it again in another community or in another year. Uh, I'd love to honor at this point, very briefly, Jerry Somerseth, who up in Skagit County in Mount Vernon vigiled every yeah. week for as many years as you've been doing yeah. it without fail, who recently passed away yeah. and uh, is lamented uh, yeah, and remembered. I, yeah, I remember him. He was quite well known as, as an icon in the movement there. And a great piano so, player. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, but uh, the idea of getting together to, to share stories uh, would be useful. I mean. Fellowship of Reconciliation could do that here in Olympia, or anybody who's watching, invite a few friends over, have a potluck, swap some stories, tell, tell, tell each other what keeps you going. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. We, we need those kinds of things. So I want to thank uh, James Bowers and Holly Gwynn Graham and Douglas Mackey. I want to thank the guests from the first half of the program, Debbie Eden, Bob Ziegler, and Marilyn Dungan, and we want to thank all the folks who've been watching because you've got your stories and we've been doing all the talking and it would be fun to, to get listeners together to share their stories as well. Um, at any given time when we're working on some worthwhile issue, uh, it's, for, it's easy to feel frustrated, like we want to make more progress and we're not moving ahead as much as we want. <clears throat> but when we look back, we often realize, oh man, we did, you know, we started out way back here and now we're up to here now, mm -hmm. you know. And, and we've got stories along the way that we can be sharing uh, and learning from so that we can be making more effective and more efficient uh, progress. Uh, and we can also be inspiring new people to come along and people who've been at it. I know uh, I've talked with a number of young people who uh, feel relieved that they don't need to reinvent the wheel. You know, uh, there's a sense sometimes where uh, old people figure, oh, we don't want to burden those younger people with, with our stuff. And I've heard from a number of young people who appreciate knowing what works 
you know, what have you tried? What have you learned? How can, and then they can carry it on from there. So we can be inspired by each other's efforts and, and our stories really can sustain us. Uh, and it's a great network of people all working. We invite people to get information about a variety of issues from the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation at 360-491-9093 or our website www.olympiafor.org. If you happen to be watching this program on a Thursday night in June, stay tuned for our documentary series, The Big Picture, which now follows immediately after our Thursday night showing of this interview program. The June documentary is called Stealing America, Vote by Vote, and it documents serious problems, inaccuracies, and abuses in counting election votes in the United States. We're all one human family. We all share one planet. We can create a better world, but we all have to work at it. And the world needs what you have to offer. Thanks. Thank you.